All right, excellent. Let's go ahead and uh, get started. Welcome, everyone. I uh, just have a couple of quick announcements before we begin. Uh, we are currently recording this webinar, uh, and we will make it available uh, to our YouTube channel shortly after. Uh, our next webinar is with Anybody Technologies, and that will happen on April 26th. Uh, keep an eye out on social media and your email for any latest announcements. So we'll go ahead and get started. So hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today entitled Taking OpenSIM into the Wild with Vicon, Blue Trident, IMUs. I'm Felix Choi, and I'm a software product manager at Vicon. I will be acting as the moderator for the webinar today. I'll launch a quick poll so I can find out a little bit more about you guys. So if you could go ahead and please answer that for me, please. I'm extremely excited for this webinar. We have a couple of great speakers today. Uh, we'll allow both to present before taking any questions, but please do type them into the Q&A and we'll answer them uh, shortly after. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, John Mortensen. John got his PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Utah. He has been a biomechanics consultant at Exponent for three and a half years. John's specialty within biomechanics is musculoskeletal modeling, particularly with OpenSim. John's interests outside of biomechanics include spending time with his wife and two daughters, fly fishing, and playing basketball. Without spoiling any of his presentation at all, if you guys do have LinkedIn, I strongly recommend that you guys follow him because he posts some great videos of his work. Um, and let me just check the poll before I hand it over. Okay, we'll go ahead and end that now. Thank you guys all for participating. So. Without further ado, over to you, John. Thank you, Felix. Let me share my screen. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining today. As Felix said, the title of my presentation is Taking OpenSIM into the Wild with Blue Trident IMUs. Uh, here are a few uh, videos of where I have gone into the wild and collected some biomechanics data with these Vicon sensors and ran them through OpenSim. I'll be talking about each of these uh, experiences in more detail later in my presentation, uh, but it was a lot of fun to take them swimming, fly fishing, mountain biking, and skiing. Uh, so an outline for my presentation today is that I'll first give you a little more of an introduction about me and about the company I work for, Exponent. And then I'll talk more about OpenSim and what OpenSense is, which is part of OpenSim. I will talk about some of the advantages of using uh, Vicon's IMUs. And then I'll also give you an overview of using the IMUs with OpenSense. So I'll talk about some data collection, some data processing, and then I'll close with some potential applications. And if you are watching this later on a recording, I have the different sections that I'm in will be highlighted in white at the top, make it easier to jump around uh, on a YouTube video later. Uh, so first, uh, I'm John. I have a PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Utah, and I am a licensed professional engineer in the state of Arizona. I am a senior engineer at Exponent, and I'm a biomechanics consultant. Uh, and at Exponent, the type of consulting that I do can be split into two broad categories, uh, some reactive biomechanics consulting, and that's what we do when something has gone wrong, when somebody's got hurt, and we often provide uh, litigation support for uh, helping understand how something happened or what could have gone differently. Uh, the other side of things that I do is more proactive in trying to make products better before an injury may occur. And with that, I have uh, had experience working with wearable technology, particularly on the wrist and the head, and also running large-scale user studies at Exponent with pushing dozens to hundreds of participants through our studies with collecting kinematics, uh, fatigue data, EMG data, uh, and survey data as well. And also, I have speci my specialty is in computational biomechanics, particularly with using OpenSIM. The company I work for, Exponent, is a multidisciplinary engineering and scientific consulting firm that brings together more than 90 different disciplines to solve important engineering, science, regulatory, and business issues facing our clients. Uh, it is a very broad consulting firm. We have experts in many different areas. We have engineers in all the main uh, areas. We have environmental scientists, we have health scientists, 
Uh, and within uh, Exponent, I'm in the biomechanics practice, but we often work across these different practices. So if you have an engineering or science problem that you would like help with, if I don't know how to solve it, I can find you someone who can at Exponent. Uh, we have offices all over the country, so we probably have some that's close to you or can travel to you. And we also have several offices in Europe and Asia as well. And our business is split between uh, the reactive and proactive work that I was describing, uh, reactive being more that litigation support, providing expert uh, witness and expert testimony, or proactive where we're helping more on product development and research development. Uh, most of our staff have PhDs uh, or advanced degrees. And uh, just an idea of, to give you more of an idea of some people I work with on a daily basis in the biomechanics group, uh, we have Dr. McLean, who as a former innovation director at Fitbit, he knows a lot about wearable technology and in the wild data. We have uh, Dr. Masters, a sports biomechanist, uh, Dr. D. Cesare, who uh, is great with working with biomechanics data and running machine learning and different types of analysis with that. Uh, so that is myself and Exponent. I will now give you a brief introduction on OpenSIM if you're unfamiliar with it. And to get there, I want to talk about muscle skeletal modeling in general. Uh, if you break up the word, we are modeling muscles interacting with a skeleton. And that can be very broad in what that means and has a wide range of complexity in muscle skeletal models. And I broke it up into three general types here on this slide, uh, increasing with complexity as you go from left to right. On the left, I have an example of a free body diagram or a by hand model. This is where you would write down your system of equations and solve for your variable of interest. Uh, something all engineers uh, get a lot of practice doing in their studies. And this can be really helpful for figuring things out quickly and getting an understanding of uh, your problem. Uh, but if the equations start to get more complicated, maybe you have lots of equations going on, or you need to solve something that's difficult to do by hand, you would move more towards the multi-body type models. And that's what I have in the middle, and that is an open sim model, which falls under that category of multi-body modeling. And this refers to having multiple rigid bodies that are connected with engineering joints. And in a musculoskeletal model, they are driven by uh, models of muscles. And this does a good job of organizing all your uh, engineering equations uh, to get that taken care of and make it simpler to work with that extends the functionality to do things that would be difficult or impossible to do by hand, uh, including uh, simulating muscle forces and the optimization routines to predict which muscle should be active and when. If you want to take it to an even greater level of complexity, you'd move more towards a finite element type model. And that breaks down your rigid bodies into smaller uh, segments that are deformable and allows you to look at stresses and strains in uh, specific locations that can tell you when something may fail and where it may fail. So it provides a lot of detail, but it can be difficult to set up or take a long time to solve. And that is why I am a supporter of using uh, multi-body models if my uh, biomechanics researcher or consulting, because it allows me to get a lot of detail, but uh, a little bit more quickly than you could with a finite element model. And so that's what OpenSim fits in nicely into this multi-body multi -body type modeling. Uh, OpenSim, if you're unfamiliar, is an open source muscle skeletal modeling software. Uh, the open source means that it is free for anybody to use. Uh, you can add to it, you can change the source code for your needs if necessary. Uh, it does work off the rigid body dynamics so it solves quickly. It has realistic muscle models. Uh, you can drive the movements either with traditional motion capture data or with IMUs, as I'm going to talk more about today. And it can solve for required muscle activations, result in joint loading. You can run these simulations in both an inverse and a forward manner, meaning that you can feed it motion data and ask what uh, the muscle forces need to be, or you can tell it, hey, here are the muscle forces, what happens next? And you can run OpenSim in its native user interface, or you can run it through uh, different scripting languages. Uh, I'm partial to doing it in MATLAB. And there's a pretty wide user uh, uh, base out there that contributes their own models in the research community. 
here I'm pulling from uh, the latest paper focusing specifically on OpenSim. Uh, there was one when it first came out, or closer to it came out in 2007. This one came out in 2018, talking about some of the updates that have been made to OpenSim and, uh, since then. I wanted to highlight what they say about themselves so that I think they say it better than I can. Uh, that OpenSim is an extensible and user-friendly software package built on decades of knowledge about computational modeling and simulation of biomechanical systems. And OpenSim supports a large and growing community of biomechanics and rehabilitation researchers, uh, facilitating exchange of models and simulations for reproducing and extending discoveries. And they drive this point home more by showing how there is an ever-increasing user base. And so if you are unfamiliar with OpenSim, now is a good time. It is uh, growing more and more each year. And some examples of models that are freely available out there, is you have models that focus on the low back, you have models that focus just on the legs or the upper extremity, the upper back, the neck, or even found a, a model that focuses on eye movements. And I thought that was a pretty fun model. Uh, now I'll talk more about what OpenSense is and how it fits into OpenSense. And to get there, I'll talk about IMUs. If you're unfamiliar, that stands for Inertial Measurement Unit. And inside an IMU, you have three different types of sensors, an accelerometer, a gyroscope, and a magnetometer. And you can drive OpenSim with uh, many different types of IMUs uh, from different companies. I really like using the ones from Vicon, the Blue Trident IMUs. Some of their advantages are that the data is stored directly on the device, uh, which means you don't need to have your phone or whatever it may be streaming to nearby in order to collect data. You can start the session, have the participant run off on a marathon, come back two hours later, and the data is still being recorded to the sensors themselves. Uh, they are waterproof, which is really helpful for making that swimming video you saw. They have a really long battery life, and this has been useful for studies that we've done that have been most of the day and we've been able to collect data all day and not have any problems. And it also comes with some really useful uh, processing for us built in, in that it can synchronize the data from all your sensors across uh, all your IMUs. And it can also calculate uh, global angles represented in quaternions. And those global angles are just your orientation in space. And to drive open, so that is your first step is to get those orientations. And you get that by fusing together the three different types of sensors uh, data to get that orientation. Vicon does that for you, but you can do it manually with uh, the data from those three different types of sensors. Once you have that orientation, uh, you have your participants strike a pose that you know, usually a neutral pose, something they can easily hold and reproduce, and you assign IMUs to each body segment you're interested in. And then from that point on, as the participant moves, uh, OpenSim will make the model articulate so that the rotations of the assigned body segments will match the rotations of the sensors themselves. And the newest uh, OpenSim versions out there include this functionality built in, and that tool is called OpenSense. So OpenSense is now a part of OpenSim comes uh, with it uh, for free and easy to use as well. And this, like I said, is accomplished. The, the inverse kinematics is accomplished by optimizing the model, model pose. And that is subject to the joint constraints to give you some more realistic data to match those IMU orientations. And I found this to be really uh, powerful in my research and in my work uh, because it means that I can take a handful of sensors a cell phone and some method of securing the sensors to my participant. I can take it anywhere and start collecting uh, biomechanics data uh, to, to study. If you've been thinking about how this might work, you may have noticed that there is a fairly significant limitation as compared to your traditional optical motion capture in that this doesn't give you translational tracking, uh, that it's focusing just on the joint angles. And what that means is that if you were to have your person bend over and touch their toes, the model bends over. But if you have them jump up and down, the model doesn't actually move up and down in space. Uh, however, is attached to the ground frame, usually the pelvis, that stays in place and everything just rotates around it. Uh, we have been looking at some advanced techniques to uh, estimate translation, those have been promising. Uh, and that's something to keep in mind when thinking about using this approach. Uh, but even with that limitation, I find that the benefits far 
outweigh the uh, the limitations of using this approach, including that you can get set up in less than 10 minutes. And I'll show you a video here about that in a second. Uh, and now we're moving on to the technique section. I'll talk about how you can do this and some of the uh, pitfalls to look out for. Uh, so first, I'll show you this video of actually setting up and getting to data collection. Uh, I have it sped up here at the first, so we don't have to watch 10 minutes of it. But on the left, you have me setting up the app, uh, the Capture You app to run the Ficon sensors uh, that I am selecting all 16 of them that I want to run today. And then once I have them down uh, recording data, you can see me waving my arms, I'm calibrating the IMUs to the local magnetic field because it uses that magnetic field to keep the orientation correct. Uh, but if I'm calibrated and ready to go, only three minutes in to get the sensors collecting data correctly, the rest of this 10 minutes is me putting these sensors on my body. And so you can speed that up and make this even faster. Uh, but some things to think about here is that it's really important to ke make careful notes. Uh, you can see I'm writing down the number of the IMU each time I'm putting one on my body, because if you confuse those, you're going to have a really difficult time working with the data. Because unlike optical motion capture, where you can look at the range of marker, arrangement of markers and figure out, hey, this one is probably on the elbow, uh, that's much more difficult to do when just looking at rotational data itself. And so it's really important you mark down which I'm using to be aware. And in this video, I'm using just uh, medical tape to secure the IMUs. Uh, I've found uh, that it can be important to have other methods of this of attaching them to, especially if your participant's going to be getting sweaty or wet, that they can fall off. Uh, some stretch, stretchable athletic tape that works really well, uh, but something to keep in mind as we're doing it as well. Uh, and here in this video, I use that stretchy tape just on my wrists, but uh, in, later on in this day, I put them on my feet as well, because those ones are prone to fall off as well. And so then in just about 10 minutes, I'm ready to start collecting data. You can see here, now we'll pull up the open sim model next to it, and we are uh, collecting the kinematic data that we need to run our open sim models, and I can begin uh, stretching for my day of data collection. Uh, now I'm going to go through each of those four videos that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation and talk about some things that I learned while collecting this data and things that could be helpful in collecting data of your own. Uh, first, uh, here is, um, that's my brother uh, collecting some fly fishing data for me. And if you notice at the beginning of this video, he tapped on the sensor on his chest. Uh, I had to do it five times. And the reason you do that is that it can be difficult to determine what's going on when you're looking just at the raw outputs of the IMUs and to know when this is happening. Uh, Vicon has some really nice tools uh, that I've become better at using for marking your regions of interest. But I found that it's really useful to just put something in your data that's easy to come back and find later. And if you have someone tap on a sensor on their chest, give some uh, solid taps, you can see those spikes in acceleration and come back later to, hey, this is when something is important is going on sometime that I want to run uh, my modeling. Uh, here is our skiing data. And this data is actually pretty tricky uh, to collect. Uh, you know, being on the side of a mountain has its own issues. Uh, but the thing that we found was most important and was able to make it so that we were able to collect this data successfully was to do a good uh, static pose before each trial uh, and make sure it's right before that trial where they're in that known pose and also to calibrate the IMUs, make sure they're going through that range of uh, orientation for the magnetic field calibration uh, frequently. Because while there isn't a much, much magnetic, magnetic disturbances on the mountain, there certainly is on a ski lift. And so we found that having the sensors on the participant Getting on the ski lift and getting off, it uh, caused problems with our calibration data, and we had to have them do a as much of a calibration while the IMUs were on their body as possible, doing a, a fun little dance to try to get the IMUs through an orientation without taking them off the body. Uh, here, I am mountain biking with one of my best friends from childhood. Uh, when I was visiting 
uh, my family in Utah. I snuck away for some mountain biking time with my friend here. And we had a good day uh, going all over the hills near his home. Uh, but something to keep in mind when you're collecting IMU data is making sure that you are thinking about how you're going to secure the sensors to your participant. Uh, I had lots of uh, uh, non-stretchable athletic tape, that white tape you see on him uh, with me, but the day was, was pretty warm that day. And as we were going, he would get sweaty and the tape would start falling off and it became an issue and made it this a challenge. We were able to get some good data here, but at the end of the day, uh, we noticed, hey, we're missing a sensor. And that was a little bit stressful for a few minutes. Uh, luckily, we were able to find it after about 15 minutes of hiking back up the trail. Uh, but that is something to keep in mind that depending on your environment, making sure these sensors stay in place uh, is important. Uh, and we used only the stretchable athletic tape for this swimming video. And that worked pretty well to keep the IMUs in place. Uh, but for something like this, uh, uh, to my knowledge, uh, no one had done this before trying to run uh, an open sim model with IMU data from swimming uh, that it was really important that we took multiple trials uh, for this we had our participant run through everything three times which was really good uh, because only one of them worked for various reasons that we learned more about each time as we were trying to get this data co to collect so if you're piloting something uh, with IMUs it's important to take multiple trials as you're figuring out what works and what doesn't, uh, because it's difficult to see real time if your data is working correctly, if your uh, methods are working correctly. I don't have a video for this one, uh, but I do have this picture on the right of what can happen if you have your sensors go through some changes in the magnetic field. Uh, the local magnetic field is used to orient the sensors, and so if that field changes dramatically, the orientation can change dramatically as well. And I've seen this happen uh, getting into a car and driving around. After a few seconds of driving around, my model looked like that, and that wasn't correct. Uh, I've seen this happen to a lesser degree when turning on wearable electronics, that uh, everything can be calibrated and look really good, but as soon as you turn on your electronics nearby, uh, everything shifts to the side a little bit or orientation changes a little bit. Uh, and I've seen this happen uh, for trying to collect data of riding an elevator and escalator, lots of moving metal there, changing magnetic fields, and it uh, makes it harder to work with the data. There are ways to fix it. Uh, the most important is to make sure you're calibrating in the space you intend to collect data on, data in, with all the equipment turned on. So try to make the where you're calibrating be as similar to the environment that you're going to be collecting data as possible. And if necessary, if you can't get away from magnetic disturbances, it is possible to calculate global angles without the magnetometer data. You have to do that outside of what Vicon currently offers. Uh, there are some open source code to do that. Uh, but that means that you're more prone to having your orientation drift over time. So you need your trials to be shorter. Uh, here I will show a video of how I uh, process my data. Nev will be showing you some great tools that Vicon has developed that will be available for everyone to download. But here's an example of how I do it. Uh, here I've uh, created a uh, MATLAB based app that allows me to read in the Vicon data and format everything to what OpenSIM is expecting and then run the OpenSIM itself. Uh, so the first step is selecting the model that you're interested in. Uh, and it brings up here a list of all the body segments in the model, and I choose the ones that I've attached I am used to. And I've sped it up here to save some time, but here I'm telling uh, uh, OpenSim which model segments should have I use attached to them and which ones they are. Then I download the data in and read it in, and that can be tricky as well because OpenSim is not forgiving on uh, having commas or spaces or tabs in the wrong spot in their uh, data files. So you have to make sure it writes it well. And now here I have it outputting just the acceleration data. And this is from that swimming data. And I didn't use the regions of interest uh, feature. I wish that I had, but I still have my participant do those uh, taps on the sensor on her chest. And you can see here, these yellow lines are those five taps. And then there's periods of relative quiet on either side of those taps. And that's when I had her in her uh, T pose there. And so I can select 
the smaller region of data that I want to collect from. Uh, I do about 40 seconds here, uh, just for this example, but I had longer trials as well. And let uh, MATLAB format everything to be ready for OpenSIM to see. And here I'll be selecting the uh, time period when they were in that pose. I'll take the average of those orientations to make the orientation that, that OpenSIM needs. And then uh, once it has written these files, uh, you are ready to change a few settings and start actually running the inverse kinematics. Uh, one of which is choosing a an IMU where you where OpenSim wants to know which direction is forward for your model. And so it asks for what that forward direction should be in in one of the IMU's reference frames. I usually use the torso IMU, and I know that the Z direction, according to the IMU, is generally forward. And then I can run the inverse kinematics. I have a toggle here that lets it do it more quickly without visualizing or actually pull up a visualizer window here. And when I made this video, I had a mistake that I didn't have the uh, model geometry loaded to the correct folder, uh, but you can still see where the IMUs are placed and you can see, hey, this is beginning that swimming motion. I'm happy with how the solution is running. And now I'll jump ahead to what the solution actually looks like. And here we have that swimming data from the IMUs. Uh, now I'll talk a little bit about some uh, potential applications before I hand it over to Nev. Uh, really, I hope that you can see uh, that OpenSense combined with the Vicon Blue Trident on News allows us to take OpenSim into the wild in a way that wasn't possible before. Uh, this saves us on costs associated with lab studies, allows us to collect uh, more natural data in the environment of interest, which can be really helpful for some of our consulting work. Uh, and it's you can set it up quickly anywhere and can be applied to many subjects pretty easily. And then once you have that OpenSIM data, you can start getting some really interesting uh, biomechanic insights, uh, such as kinematics and kinetics. Uh, you can use the OpenSIM solvers to predict uh, muscle forces and joint loading. And we've even done some interesting work where we're taking the muscle activation and predicting uh, muscle fatigue as well. And it allows you to run what if simulations where you systematically alter the applied forces or postures or speeds and see what the results might be if things had been different, whether it's a different scenario for the participant or if they had different products or whatever it may be, you can run hundreds or thousands of open sim simulations pretty quickly to get some interesting insights. Uh, here, try a video of me uh, collecting some ergonomics data, uh, joint loading at an office station, and I'm demonstrating how uh, if you have some poor postures, you may be prone to do as the day goes on. If you lean forward and get close to your screen, you increase the loading in both your low back and your neck. Uh, here I have an example of looking at how moment arm changes in your gluteus muscle depending on what you're doing. If you bend forward to go a little bit faster, that moment arm decreases. And then if you stand up to generate more torque, that moment arm increases. And so we can look at how your participant may be changing their approach in order to win the race. Uh, here, I use this approach to analyze how I throw a frisbee. And I love playing ultimate frisbee, but I hadn't thought enough about how important it is to plant that forward foot and rotate about it. And here, yeah, I was able to study which muscles are activating and when and get an understanding for, hey, what really increases the speed of that uh, disc as I throw it. Uh, here, I've, I've used OpenSim to study some falls from height. You can imagine collecting data on someone that doesn't actually fall, we have something in the way, or they're able to recover. But you can use those movements prior to recovery uh, to give some input and then look at, hey, what might have happened in the, uh, in the future of how someone might have fallen or gotten to the location that they were found in. Uh, as I alluded to, we have used this open sim output to study uh, fatigue and recovery of muscles using equations from the literature. And what this has allowed us to do is look at, hey, we change uh, a product in some way uh, 
what do we predict that they're going to say how fatigued they are after using it for a certain period of time? So that gives us some really valuable insights in product development. And in summary, uh, from my presentation, that using IMU sensors, particularly the Vicon ones, can provide OpenSim with kinematic data easily and in many environments that aren't feasible for traditional motion capture. And OpenSim can provide biomechanical data that's otherwise inaccessible, that it's a really useful tool. And going back to the company I work for, Exponent, uh, we can help with biomechanics or other engineering and scientific consulting uh, should you have the need. Uh, please feel free to reach out. I'm sure that we can uh, find the right person to help you with your projects. And with that, I shall uh, pass it back. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. That was that was fantastic. It's uh, I know for me, it's always great to hear from our, our users directly of what, what they're actually doing with our hardware and software. And I think a lot of our viewers would actually get more, um, more from it, uh, hearing from a customer. Um, I know that I said that I would be answering questions afterwards, but one of the questions actually is quite pertinent to this next session. Um, so I'm not ignoring the, the questions, um, but I will take this one. Um, it says, do the Bicon Blue Trident IMUs have to be used with OpenSim or OpenSense? Can data be processed with other software for those who haven't used OpenSim in the past? So I'm not gonna answer that right this second. Um, and hopefully in this next section, you will get your answer. If not, we can address that again. So um, my next speaker, uh, for those who don't know him, is Nev Perez. Uh, Nev got his PhD in biomechanics from the University of Western Australia. He's been with Vicon for eight and a half years on the support team. Uh, when he's not in the lab doing the motion capture of dinosaurs or befriending animals on work trips, uh, he's finding an adrenaline rush that will uh, top climbing on top of a moving airplane while he does barrel rolls. He's open to any and all suggestions. Uh, and Nev will probably be a bit too humble to say so, but he's actually very uh, you know, directly responsible for a lot of the work that you've seen uh, from Vicon's side. So um, please do uh, give him his uh, credit where it's due. Uh, with that in mind, I will send it over to Nev. Thank you, Felix. Um, so the beauty of CaptureU is that it allows the researcher to collect data independently of an optical system. We can take our research out of the laboratory and into the real world. John has showed us some amazing examples of what we can do with IMU data captured in CaptureU. To do that, John showed you a program that he created in MATLAB to calculate inverse kinematics using the OpenSIM API. We wanted to provide our Vicon users with the ability to perform these same analyses in a simple and efficient way without having to use MATLAB, Python, or any other external program other than OpenSim. While John has processed his data with a program that he created in MATLAB, we took it a step further and created a workflow where you can process your IMU data using OpenSim tools with only an executable meaning that the only external program that you need is OpenSim. This folder is similar to what you'll see when you download it from my Models and Scripts page. I'm going to go into the CaptureU folder, and here you can see some folders that contain the regions of interest data that has been exported from CaptureU, my OpenSim model, and the executable. I'm going to launch the CaptureU to OpenSim executable and run it on the data in this folder. While the executable is loading, I want to mention that this GUI allows you to calculate inverse kinematics in four steps. I'm going to explain those steps in more detail when I have the GUI open and in front of me. Before that, though, I want to reiterate John's point, that there is minimal setup required to capturing data in CaptureU. In addition to the steps that John outlined, I've exported my aligned data as regions of interest to this common folder. Now that the GUI has launched, the first thing that I'm going to do is to select my OpenSim model. In this case, it's the Raju Gopal model. The next thing that I'm going to do is to select my root capture new folder. This is the folder that contains my data that has been exported as regions of interest. The third step is to convert my capture new coordinate system, which is Z up, to the OpenSim coordinate system, which is Y up. We do this by rotating the x-axis by negative 90 degrees. We've also designated a root IMU, in this case the pelvis, 
and the direction of the IMU's coordinate system when the subject is facing forward. In this case, it's negative Z. The fourth step is to assign each IMU to a segment. And while I'm doing this, I just want to reiterate how important it is that we make sure that we know which IMU belongs to which segment. Finally, I'm going to press set segments and IMUs. When the code starts to run, what you will see is in the root folder, you will see this captured U OpenSense output folder. And this contains the codes, uh, the files that have been generated from this script. The most important of which is the motion file, which is the file that contains the IMU inverse kinematic results. And you can plot this in OpenSim if you wanted to or Excel. So what's going on? This script is converting the capture U data into a format that OpenSim needs to do its calculations. It is then using that data to perform an IMU calibration. And you can think of this as assigning each IMU to the appropriate OpenSim segment. Finally, the IMU inverse kinematics are being calculated. The considerations for using this app are number one, you need to know what OpenSim model you're going to use as the segments will be determined from that model. You need to know which IMU belongs to which segment. You need to capture a single trial with multiple regions of interest, one of which is called calibration. You'll also need to export those regions of interest and the time aligned data to that common folder. As John has shown, Capture U is a fantastic tool that allows you to capture inverse kinematic data in the wild independently of a lab space. However, this means that capturing other data types, such as optical marker data, may be more difficult, especially outside. So we recognize that a lot of research is still being conducted in a laboratory environment, which leads me to talk about Nexus 2. Nexus 2 allows us to capture Nexus 2 allows us to capture multimodal synchronized data in a lab environment, which in addition to IMUs includes trajectory, EMG, and force plates to name a few. The Nexus workflow is a straightforward in principle, but the steps are different to reflect the differences between how the data is captured and managed between Nexus and Capture U. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to load my calibration trial. Then I've already set up a list of pipeline operations and I'm going to run the OpenSense calibration one. I'm going to launch a GUI and again, it will take time. So while we're waiting for the GUI to launch, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the preparation. Number one, the IMUs need to be calibrated and that's the same as Capture U. Number two, unlike Capture U, we actually need to name the IMUs in the system file that you see here. Number three, the IMUs must be transferred and a C3D must be created for this app to work properly. And number four, we have to have a VSK loaded, okay? The GUI has generated. And just like OpenSim, what we do is we select the OpenSim model. In this case here, it's going to be the Raja Gopal model. So I'm just gonna navigate to where it is. Next, I'm going to apply that same rotation to convert the Nexus global coordinate system to the OpenSim coordinate system. I'm going to select the root segment. In my case, it's the pelvis. In John's case, it was the torso. And because I've got the, pel uh, the IMU on the back of the pelvis, my, the pelvis' Z direction is facing forward in the negative Z direction. And I'm also loading a VSK, and I'm going to press Submit. What's happened is in the background, it has gone and created a new OpenSense outputs folder that lives in your session folder. And I'm going to explain what those, um, what those files are very briefly, as they're the same files that are created in uh, CaptureU as well. Number one, you've got a storage file. And number two, you've got the OpenSim file. Okay. Now that I've done my calibration step, I'm going to do the kinematics on, I'm going to calculate my inverse kinematics on a dynamic trial, in this case here, called walk.
unlike the Capture U and uh, calibration, Nexus calibration OpenSense apps, there is no GUI that needs to be interacted with. This means that you can actually run this in the background in a uh, batch processing window. So you can set it and forget it and let it run. What's going to happen is back in that OpenSense folder, we're going to see a bunch of other files, such as the motion file. And this is the most important file for um, OpenSim if you want to analyze your data in that platform. What is really cool, though, is that it will take the same script, will take that motion file data and write it back to a model outputs folder here underneath the heading OpenSense data. And what we can also do is we can plot that data back, um, plot that data in Nexus as that data is written back into the C3D. Okay. So what is happening? Because Nexus and Capture U are different, the workflow has changed slightly. However, in both cases, the same steps are being performed. That is, the OpenSim model is being selected. The IMUs are being assigned to the OpenSim segment on the OpenSim model. And the inverse kinematics are being calculated. In Nexus, those inverse kinematic outputs are also being written back to the C3D. Just like Capture U, there are some considerations that you have to have for Nexus. A lot of those considerations are the same. Number one, the IMUs must be named in Nexus. This is to assign the IMUs to the OpenSim segment. Number two, the IMUs need to be transferred to get the full frame resolution a C3D must be reconstructed, and a VSK needs to be loaded. And this is so that the model outputs can be written back to the C3D. So I've spent a little bit of time discussing what is required of Capture U and Nexus, but the question is, what about OpenSim? What do I need to do? All you need to do is to make sure that OpenSim 4.4 is installed and that the OpenSim 4.4 bin folder is added to the environment variables list. We wanted customers to be able to calculate inverse kinematics using our Blue Trident IMUs as soon as possible. So we created these simple executables to allow you to do so. Please keep in mind that this workflow is temporary and will be approved upon in the future. This is going to be a two-stage process. One, where we improve on these specific executables. And the second is where we integrate the OpenSense workflow natively in Nexus and capture you in the future. Scripts will be available for download after this webinar, and they will be available on our Models and Scripts web page. Instructional PDFs and example data will also be included with those downloads. We won't be including supplemental videos, but they, those supplemental videos will be available um, in the future upon request. The three takeaways that I want to leave you with are, number one, we identified that you want to calculate kinematics, and this solution allows you to do that. Number two, we have created a very easy and streamlined way for you to do so, independent of other external programs. And finally, once you've collected your IMU data, this IMU inverse kinematic solution is open source. This means that your inverse kinematic modeling is driven by the power of the research community and our technology. Thank you. Some thanks, Nev. That was a that was a great talk. And as I can tell from the uh, QA, there's a lot of interest in what we've presented here. So I'm just going to kind of go through uh, the list now, and uh, we'll try to answer as many of these as possible. Um, so um, the first question I'm assuming is, uh, is for John because it came in during John's presentation. Uh, but if Nev, you you want to add something, please feel free. Uh, how long were your trials and how well did the IMUs perform given that they drift? That's a great question. Uh, when you're fusing together the data to include the magnetometer data, the drift in orientation is actually pretty minimal. Uh, to the point where I've been able to run uh, trials for collecting data on the <laughs> neck uh, for three hour segments and not had any issues with it. Uh, if I'm running into the areas where I know there are going to be magnetic disturbances and can't use the magnetometer data, that drops down dramatically and needs to be uh, maybe 30 seconds long. 
I don't really have much more to add to that. Um, to be honest with you, my testing has all been done in the Nexus workspace. So it's been pretty much like overground walking in the laboratory kind of thing. So I'm definitely going to defer to John's better knowledge about that. Okay, second question. Um, how are you scaling models with just the IMU data? Another good question. John's, yeah. And as you can see, if you look on the OpenSim documentation for OpenSense, if you're only interested in the joint kinematics, uh, no scaling is necessary with the IMUs because it's looking at how the joint angles change. And that's not going to change if your model gets longer or shorter because you're looking at just the orientation data from the IMU segment. If you need to be more specific, though, then you have to do some manual scaling, and that would require uh, being, you can do it really simple by doing just their height and weight, or you can get more specific and actually measure different uh, body segments to put into OpenSim. And scaling in OpenSim is, uh, can be a bit of an art form. Okay, uh, next question, is there, and this can be for both really, is there a minimum IMU uh, to, be avail uh, to be able to process the data? So my response to that question is that is very much model dependent. You would need to know which model that you're using, and then you would go accordingly with that one. The Raja Gopal model that I've done all my testing on has got a full skeleton. Um, in the drop downs that I was using, um, you can see, I think there's something like 22 segments that you can use, not all of them that you can place an IMU on. When I did this testing with my model, I definitely had one on the torso and then um, the pelvis and then the segments of the lower uh, of the lower body. Um, John has definitely used more IMUs than that, but yeah, I think it's personally um, model dependent. And what you want to, oh, sorry, to continue on with what I was saying, I only drove my model with the torso and the lower body. Um, if I place them on the arms, then you could drive that. So it's really depending on what joints you want to, what segments and joints you want to drive, in my opinion, when Correct. John take over. Yeah, to, to add to that, it's just what body segments you're interested in. You need one IMU for each segment of the body you're treating as rigid. And so you, know, you can put one on the head, that's for your whole skull, and then maybe one for the torso, one for the neck. Uh, for full body, where I've included hands and feet, I've done up to 16 before, but most real applications I've done, you don't need the entire body and it can be much less than that. Excellent. Um, next question. The calibration is based on only one static pose. What if the subject has poor static pose? For example, has 25 degree pelvis interior tilt in static pose. That hits on one of the limitations of the approach. And you need to make sure they're in a good static pose when you're saying they are in the data because the process is saying, from these orientations, relative to those orientations, how does the IMU orientation change? So if your static pose is no good, you're gonna have problems with your uh, output at the end. Now, I find that it's helpful to average over a few seconds of time, but you still need to make sure your participants in a good static pose to get this to work properly. Something that I've done is when I, I'm gonna share my screen again. Something that I've done with my subjects is I have got my subjects to stand in the same pose uh, based on my OpenSim model. So I've loaded my OpenSim model and I've seen that they're standing like this and I get my subjects to stand there. Um, John is definitely better versed in this, but um, I believe that what we can do as well is, um, I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen real quick. Um, I believe that we can adjust that base pose in OpenSim as well and perhaps use that as another idea. Please. Correct. I've had, I've had times where they didn't have a good static pose and I still needed the data. And luckily we had video, so I was able to manipulate the OpenSim's expected static pose to match what they were in and that improved the data a lot. Uh, the next question, and it's kind of been uh, addressed already, but um, in case you guys want to add anything, do you perform any model scaling from the IMU data? It's uh, just depending on the uh, uh, application, right? If you uh, need to get into the levels of uh, uh, muscle activation or forces, then that's often necessary. And so sometimes I do, but other times I don't need to if I'm more interested in, in kinematics or more in general relationships, it's not as necessary. Yep. Awesome. Uh, okay, next question. I think we kind of anticipated this one a little bit, but 
Has there been any validation between the angle measurements using these IMUs and motion capture systems? From the Vicon point of view, no. Um, our focus has very much been on getting this workflow integrated. Um, we also feel to start off with, um, in the short term, it's very much community driven. Um, and we're confident that, you know, people are going to be doing those investigations. And it is something that we will be looking at in the future, but how far or what we can say, I can't really comment on anymore um, in the short term. Yeah, for non Vicon IMUs, uh, for other Vicon, for other IMUs, this has been tested with OpenSense and a couple of papers out there, and they both found pretty good agreement. Uh, I think it's generally one paper, I think, was three to five degrees error on average, and uh, the other one was, I think, uh, five to six as well. So this is pretty good. Uh, uh, relationship between them, and if not for I, not for Vicon IMUs in general, just this approach of using IMUs. Uh, there is literature on that as a place to start. Yeah, I believe OpenSim also did their own webinar, um, kind of uh, uncovering some of those results as well. Uh, I think right. presented by Carmichael. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, thanks for the talk. Is the OpenSim application real time, or does it require post processing of the IMU data? Also, I was wondering how this can be applied to acquire kinetics information of the joint if only kinematics is obtained from IMU without data of any external forces. There is an application from OpenSim where they have uh, made it real time. It's a really cool uh, presentation and paper where they uh, use uh, some different IMUs and uh, have it running through a Raspberry Pi to give real time inverse kinematics. But for the applications shown today, and with the Vicon sensors, no, that has been uh, pros pass the processing for the kinematics. I don't feel want to add to that now. Um, so I know that one of our one of my coworkers in the UK, I'm not sure if she's on this uh, call at the moment. She has definitely been looking into doing some work with that. Um, one of the limitations that I found in Nexus is the Bluetooth streaming, where um, it's there are gaps in that data and it's a preview mode. So, um, yeah, it is a possibility, but not right now. Yeah. A challenge to get all the data off the sensors and process through quickly is, is the challenge. Uh, for the kinetics question, uh, that is uh, something you have to be careful about and think about when you're collecting the data as well. Uh, that if your application is higher up in the body, you can do a, a top down approach. Let's say you're looking at loading in the neck uh, and you have the movements of the uh, of the torso, you can look at those joint loading in between doing that top-down approach. If you're doing lower in the body and you need those ground reaction forces, uh, that can be more challenging. Um, we've done it in the past uh, for in the wild, we've used some uh, insole sensors uh, to get some force there to apply to the model as well. So there are uh, workarounds, but that's something you have to be careful about and think about of how you can define uh, what the loading is actually going to be in, in that varies by your by situation. We are um, quickly approaching time and there's still a lot of questions. So I'm gonna try and skip through uh, to some ones because there are a bit of uh, duplicates on here. Um, what are the Blue Trident IMU frequency options for data reporting? I can actually answer that one. So I'm gonna take, take that for, for both platforms. It's gonna be 225 um, for the global angles. I'll, I'll actually type that in as an answer. Um, okay, another question here. Um, can you provide more information on the global orientation that's calculated from the IMUs? Are these methods open source or is it something that was custom built? Um, I'll answer actually that one as well. Unfortunately, we can't really comment too much about um, yeah, the, the global angles and, and the sensor fusion um, aspect, but you are welcome actually um, to calculate just the raw data and perform your own sensor fusion if you'd like as well. Um, thinking there are some open source code to assist with that as well. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've done that when I need to get rid of the magnetometer data because of magnetic disturbances. I've used some open source code for that, taking the raw outputs from capture you to make that work. Perfect. Um, how can we know whether there is relative motion between IMUs and muscles? I'm assuming. I'm assuming they actually mean skeleton in the muscles. Uh, and movement of the IMU relative to the skeleton. And I think that there certainly, uh, just as you get uh, skin artifact with optical sensors, you're going to get similar effect happening with the IMUs. If there's lots of adipose tissue or something in between, it's going to uh, reduce your accuracy of what the skeleton is actually doing. 
Uh, you do get some benefit in that these are looking at orientation themselves instead of uh, X, Y, Z coordinates. And so uh, maybe a little bit of jiggling isn't as much of an issue, but it's it's still definitely in a source of error in this approach. And but to, to quantify how much that is, that could be an interesting study with including optical motion capture versus IMUs or uh, getting closer to the skeleton and max themselves. Okay, excellent. Um, is there any functional calibration that's available? I'm, I'm I am unaware of anything to do with that. I believe that the calibration, this is purely with respect to the IMUs and the OpenSense, uh, open, yeah, OpenSense uh, workflow. Um, I believe it's just the IMU placement step. Um, I don't know if there would be any advantage of doing a range of motion because I think that would just corrupt the placement of the IMUs on the IMU placer step. Do you want anything to add to that? No. Nope. No. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm trying to answer as many questions as I can in the chat while also um, asking the questions. Um, let's see. How do you convert IMU data to use it directly with OpenSense without Nexus? Uh, you have a script that takes the data and writes it. Yeah, it's, it's, it can be pretty tedious and you have to be really careful in making that script. Uh, because you take the quaternion data from the IMU file and make sure you just format it exactly how OpenSim is expecting to see it. That's pretty much why I wrote these um, these scripts so that you don't have to do that. Yeah. Um, excellent. Yeah. So we are um, just at time right now. We do we did have a lot more questions. Um, if you do have questions, I uh, definitely urge you to email support at vicon.com. Um, and we will try to address those as soon as possible. I, I really do appreciate everyone taking the time uh, to attend this webinar. It was a great uh, success. A lot of attendees, a lot of questions, a lot of interest. Um, as Nev said, we will have scripts available shortly after this webinar uh, to help you process your Blue Trident IMUs in CaptureU or Nexus. So please look out for that. And also, again, keep in mind that we will have uh, our next webinar in April with Anybody Technologies. So um, keep your eye out for that. I want to thank. Our two presenters again for their great presentations and great insights. Uh, thanks, John, and, and thanks, Nev, and uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you, everyone.